Women's Chamber Choir. There's so much talent at Hope College. It's amazing. Give them one more love. Women's Chamber Choir. Well done. Friends, it's my great privilege and honor to introduce to you an emerging friend of mine and of the ministry at Hope College, Reverend James Ellis III. I just love that you're, you have a third. There you go. Um, James is the pastor of Peace Fellowship Church in Washington, D.C. He's a writer, author, blogger. He's a husband. Um, he is a friend, and above all, he is a lover of Jesus Christ, and he's here um, to share the Word of God with us this morning. Would you give a warm, welcoming, Hope College welcome, <laughs> Reverend James Ellis I occasionally blog with the Huffington Post, and recently they asked some of us bloggers to participate in a video series that they've launched. Uh, the idea of the video is that parents would interview their children, or that adult children might interview their parents. My wife and I don't have children of our own, but we do have two very cool nephews. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law's children, ages five and one. Xavier, the five-year-old, always has interesting questions to ask me, and, and we have great conversations together, so I figured I'll interview him for this video project. For me, life is all about sacrificial relationships. It's about offering sacrificial love to others because of God first having demonstrated his love to me. I can't change people. You cannot change people. But we can love people and let God change them. Years ago, there's a, a gospel songstress, very legendary one, named Mahalia Jackson, and she, she gave us some traveling music along this journey. She said, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody that they are traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. We need to be a conduit or a mechanism through which Faith can be felt, through which God's love can be felt. Speaking to his friends, the disciples, we find Jesus' words in John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. Jesus says this, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends to lay down one's life for one's friends. I pray that Jesus' words ignite revival in our hearts. I'll just go ahead uh, and ask for your forgiveness ahead of time because I, I know that I'm just your guest preacher here today and, and we don't know each other well, so I pray that you'll pardon me if I step on anybody's sanctified or naive toes, but I believe that Contrary to the words that Jesus uh, spoke that we just read, Christians are not always known for laying their lives down for others. And even when we do, you could argue, I would argue, that sometimes it's in an insincere, manipulative way, a way in which we colonize, or we conquer, or we confuse, or we control. And increasingly, we're less and less committed to building bridges to people who cannot give us an identifiable, sizable return on our investment. Easter is an event that shook up the world. We should celebrate Easter as we did a few weeks ago, and now as we continue into this season of Eastertide, honoring Jesus as the risen, resurrected Lord, it's important that we do that. After all, Easter is the reason that Christianity exists. Easter proves that Jesus was not a lunatic, that the prophecies were true, that God is not a liar, that this ragamuffin from a lowly town called Nazareth was without doubt chosen to save the world. But amidst all of the multicolored eggs and amidst the eating of candy and the embracing of fuzzy wuzzy bunny rabbits, somehow or another, Jesus gets lost in the sauce 
of our selfishness. How can people have faith in the Lord and ask him to save them if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? That someone is you and me. It's hard to hear, much less understand and receive the gospel. I can tell you from experience, if no one's dying, dying to represent it for you. So my question for you this morning is, who, who, who are you dying for? Who are you dying for? That seems to be Jesus' charge to us, this idea that there's nothing more profound, nothing more awe-inspiring, no higher illustration of love than for someone to lay their life down for another. Of course, in, in this specific instance, Jesus is speaking about how Christians in particular can be in relationship with one another, other fellow believers. But the implication, the clear implication here is, is also that Jesus expects them, his disciples, and that Jesus also expects us today to die for those who are far away from him. Because that's what Jesus did for us. While we were still helpless sinners, lost in the muck and mire of our sin, Jesus came to save. So again, I ask, who are you dying for? You don't have to be a super Christian, by the way, whatever that means, in order to do this work from God. Whether the Lord has destined you to one day be a mother or a father or a military serviceman or servicewoman or a mathematician, whether God's will is that you enter the business world or law or music or medicine, whether the Holy Spirit desires that you become a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. No, no matter what you do in life, you can be exactly who you are, exactly who God's called you to be, in, and you can participate in this sacred missional work that God calls all to do who follow him. You can take your time, you can take your money and your power, your talent, your preferences and your privileges and use all of it to lay down your life in order that someone else might feel God through how you relate to them. One person that I'm dying for is Xavier, my five-year-old nephew that I mentioned earlier. When a few years ago, he was diagnosed with an eating disorder that makes him sensitive, highly sensitive to texture and taste of certain kinds of foods, and he wouldn't eat as a toddler, and he would actually gag as you would try to feed him. I, I decided that I would, almost for an entire year, while he went to specialists, I made the 80-mile round trip from D.C. down to Baltimore for his appointments. I wanted him to know that I love him very much. When Xavier wants to talk to me when I go visit him and he wants me to play cars and get on the floor and ask me all kinds of really interesting questions about life, I, I stop everything and I make time to invest in him because I want him to know that, that he is special to me. Even now as a kindergartner, when he will tell me sometimes that, well, Uncle Buddy, I, I, that's my name, that's what they call me, Uncle Buddy. Uh, <laughs> He'll say, Uncle Buddy, I don't, I don't really like school. And so I'll, I'll get a little concerned. And so I'll, I'll just randomly show up at his school and I'll, I'll eat lunch with him because I want him to know that, that I love him dearly. In this interview uh, that I did with Xavier for the Huffington Post, uh, at the end of it, I, I ask him, I say, Xavier, do you know that I love you? And he says, yes. And I say, uh, how do you know that I love you? And Xavier does something that, that is awesome. He puts his hand on his heart, and, and, he, and he says, here, I, that's why. And um, I, I almost lost it. I almost, almost broke down. Um, I guess all I'm trying to say is that uh, Xavier is following, unfortunately, in the same footsteps that, that, that I did as a child. He's being raised. I love my sister. Don't get me wrong. I love my parents, but I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Uh, in my family, we never prayed. We had no church that we went to. There was no Bible. Uh, and, and he's being raised in that same kind of environment. And it, to be honest, freaks me out. It, it, it makes me fearful. But I cannot change people. You cannot change people. But I, I can make sure that I invest and that I sacrifice for Xavier, that, that one day, maybe one day, 
He might come to me and, and say, Uncle Buddy, what do I have to do to be a Christian? What do I have to do to be saved? And the reality is that even if he never does that, I'm still going to love him. I'm still going to sacrifice for him. And, and that's my charge to you today. Who are you dying for? If you want someone to become a Christian, that's great. That's our hope. That's what we want to push towards. That's what we dream about. But what if they never do? Will you still sacrifice your time? Will you still sacrifice your talents to be able to invest in someone else? Who are you dying for? It's in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that I offer these words to you today, and I pray that it falls on rich soil, rich soil that multiplies over time. Amen.